Good afternoon and happy Monday to all of our event space viewers. You are back in the virtual event space and we are back here with Tony Gale. Huge thank you to our sponsor, Sony, for today's presentation, which is week two of a four week introductory photo series with Tony that he's going to be doing. Today we're talking about settings. So we're diving a little bit more in depth. So I will kick it over to Tony and get right to it so that I don't chew up valuable time. So, Tony, welcome. Thank you, Derek. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony Artist of, Im of Imagery. Today, we are going over part two of our Basics of Photography series, uh, Settings and Exposure. One thing to keep in mind as we go through this, much like last week, is I'm covering a lot of ground and a lot of information in not very much time. So, I expect there to be a lot of questions. And if you have questions that we don't get to, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll try and answer them. And hopefully it will give you enough information to look for more in-depth things if you need it. But it's, it's a lot. I believe in you. You're all smart people. You got this. But if you get a little confused, don't worry about it. It's going to happen. I am also a Manfrotto ambassador at Next Right Colorado and APA national president. So photo basics. We're gonna be covering settings, exposure, ISO, shutter speed, aperture, white balance, focusing, and the differences between JPEG and RAW. So some of the settings we're gonna talk about are the ones on your dial. You've got manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, program, video, auto, and then depending on the camera model you have, you may have more or less things. It's gonna vary based on the specific camera, and if you're not shooting with the Sony, which is what I'm using, you will have something similar. The terminology may be a little bit different, but the broad strokes of what I'm talking about should apply to any camera, even if it's not a Sony, we still like you. As a quick summary, and I'm gonna get into more details of this, don't worry, there is something called the exposure triangle. That is a combination of your ISO or ISO. I still call it ISO, even though people tell me I'm wrong. Your shutter speed and your aperture, which is designating f-stops. Those three things combine to give you a correct exposure, which is to say, to give you an exposure that it's not too light, it's not too dark, everything is reflected the way it should be. I will get into more detail on this, but because things aren't really linear, it's not really clear this step and then this step and then this step, it may feel like we're jumping around. So I wanted to give you this frame of reference. They all work together in collaboration. We will go into more detail. So if you are like, what's going on? I don't understand. We will get to it. If at that point you have more questions, please speak up. On your camera, you may have a dial that looks like this. It's got all of your settings. M is for manual. On the left is an A6000, on the right is an A7R4. Almost any Sony camera is gonna be similar. S is for shutter priority. Shutter priority, manual is you set everything. You set your aperture, you set your shutter. It is something that I occasionally see on Facebook groups. People like to say things like professionals only shoot in manual. That's not true. Professionals are anyone who gets paid and however they shoot is fine. I don't only shoot in manual. I shoot in manual a lot, but I shoot in other things as well. And everybody I know shoots in a variety of settings. Anyone that tells you that there's only one correct setting for your camera and one correct way to shoot is at best oversimplifying. And I would strongly disagree with that assessment. Whatever settings work for you, whatever settings get you the photos you want, those are good settings. If they don't get you the photos that you want, try something else. So shutter priority, you set the shutter speed and then the camera does the rest. It will set the aperture. You have aperture priority, which is the reverse. You set the f-stop, the camera sets the shutter. One thing to keep in mind is if you're in shutter priority, it is easier to have a shutter speed. And again, we'll get into more detail. It is easier to have a shutter speed that there is no correspondingly appropriate f-stop to get a good exposure. 
then if you're an aperture priority where you can set your f-stop, it is more likely that there is a corresponding shutter that is appropriate to get you the correct exposure. The reason for that is there's a much larger range of shutter speeds than there is of f-stops. And again, f-stops, aperture, they're going to be roughly interchangeable, but we'll get into more details on that. So I tend to use aperture priority much more than shutter priority. If I'm just walking around, walking around the city, walking around traveling, I'm mostly an aperture priority. Then you have P for program. Some people like to say P for professional. Program will set your shutter speed and your aperture as the camera sees fit, whatever it thinks is appropriate to get you the correct exposure. You have video mode, movie mode. You have the green auto. That will set everything. It will set your f-stop, it will set your shutter speed, it will set your ISO. With the more controlled ones, manual shutter, aperture pro uh, program, all of those, the camera won't set your ISO, and I will explain all of this later. It won't set your ISO unless you tell the ISO to do auto ISO. I know that sounds like a word salad, but we'll, we'll cover it. And then, uh, depending on what camera you're using, you have intelligent auto, which is the orangish one with the plus. Intelligent auto is essentially the same as the green auto, except under certain circumstances, it will shoot multiple frames automatically and combine them in camera. With intelligent auto, and I believe the green auto as well, I don't use the green auto really, um, it's also going to shoot in JPEG. It probably won't let you shoot in RAW, and we will explain what that means later. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Intelligent auto is the green. Superior auto is the one with multiple exposures. Then you have scene. Scene is you tell the camera, I'm shooting a landscape. I'm shooting somebody running. I'm shooting a portrait. I'm shooting a flower. And it will adjust the settings to what the camera believes is appropriate to get you the correct exposure and the correct settings for that particular subject. You have sweet panorama. That is very much going to depend on the camera. The current A7s and the current A9s do not have sweet panorama. The earlier ones did. Sweet panorama is a setting where instead of getting a picture like this, this is with my A6400 at 16 millimeters, this is sweet panorama. So instead of just getting the middle, you put it on sweet panorama, you move the camera, it combines multiple images to get you a long panoramic shot. With the 6400, the regular photo would be 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. The sweet panorama is 8,192 by 1,856 pixels. So it's much wider, but it's also not as high. And it only works in JPEG. It can be cool. It's super fun. But you can do that in uh, post as well in Photoshop pretty easily. Uh, you also have memory recall, which will bring up settings that you tell it to do. You have slow and quick on the newer full frame cameras, and I think the 6600, uh, which is a video setting that will do slow motion or quick motion. And then on the full frame cameras, you have multiple memory settings. Instead of just the one memory recall, you have multiple memory settings that you can have customized. So memory one is program at ISO 200 at whatever, anything you want. However, this is something I tell people a lot. Break glass in case of emergency, you're trying to take a picture, nothing is working, you've changed all your settings, what is going on? You just need to take that picture, just put it on green auto. There is nothing wrong with shooting in auto if it gives you the results you want. And because it overrides pretty much everything you've told it to do, if something is going wrong and you think it's because you changed a setting or whoever had the camera last changed a setting, maybe you let your friend borrow it, just put it in green auto if you're in a rush. All right, so back to exposure. A photo with the correct amount of light to appear right or accurate, I put that in quotes because photography is subjective and the right exposure and the correct exposure isn't necessarily a clear thing. Maybe you want the picture bright or dark, for example. But the correct amount of light to appear right or accurate is a good exposure. 
That's what that means. Your camera's meter, if you use the in-camera meter, is going to average everything out to get a nice, even middle tone. All right, here we are with the exposure triangle again. ISO, aperture, f-stop, and then shutter speed. Those three things work together. If you change one, the others have to change. So it's not as simple as just changing one. Maybe you want a shallow depth of field, but you also want your shutter speed to be two seconds, and you want to shoot outside in full sun. You're not going to be able to do that without say adding a neutral density filter because everything works together. Exposure is often described in stops. One stop is equal to a doubling or halving of the amount of light. So a shutter speed of 1 1 25th of a second changing to 1 2 50th of a second is a one stop change. A shutter speed of 1 25th of a second changing to 1 60th is also a one stop change. 125 to 250, twice as fast. 125 to 60th, half as fast. I know that technically half of 125 is 62 and a half, but that's not how cameras work. F-stops are a little more complicated. An F-stop of F8 changing to F11 is a one-stop change. An F-stop of F8 changing to F56 is a one-stop change. F-stops are a formula that's a ratio of the focal length and the size of the lens opening. So it's not quite as clear. It's easy to look at a shutter speed. And if you double it, sure, that's twice as much. If you have it, that's half as much. With, with f-stop, it's not quite that simple. I have a little chart that will tell you all of them. An ISO of 100 changing to 200 is a one-stop change. An ISO of 100 changing to 50 is a one-stop change. It's a little similar to shutter speed in that if you double it, it's one stop. If you have it, it's one stop. And yes, it can be a little weird, especially f-stop, but that's just the nature of the beast. So to talk about, I was trying to figure out the best way to explain how the three things work together. For the purposes of this diagram, we're going to say that 100 is what you need to have a correct exposure. That's based on nothing. I probably even should have used 255 because that's the number of uh, levels of gray that you have. 100 gets you correct exposure. For the purposes of this explanation, if you go around and say 100 is a correct exposure, nobody's going to know what you're talking about. But what you need to do is combine your ISO, your shutter speed, and your f-stop to get 100. So in the top, it's a little more f-stop or a little bit more ISO, and then about the same shutter speed and f-stop. If you want to lower your ISO so that there's less ISO, you can make your shutter speed longer to make up for that difference. So less ISO, less sensitivity to light. Longer shutter speed, more light comes in, and we will explain all of this in a bit. And the same f-stop, you could do that. or you could make your ISO lower, letting in less sensitivity to light, make your shutter speed also what it was, so letting in less light, but make your f-stop larger, letting in more light. Any combination of those things that gives you that, that total number of 100, which isn't on the camera anywhere, it's just an analogy, but gives you that correct amount of light will work. However you want that ratio to be, there's reasons to use more or less of any of those settings, and we'll get into that. But that's the rough uh, explanation of how it works. ISO, or ISO, is the camera's sensitivity to light. If you've been around as long as I have, we used to call it ASA. The numbers are the same. If you're really old school, you might know DIN, which is a totally different one. ASA of 100, which is a film speed, and ISO of 100, same thing. And all it is is the camera's sensitivity to light. So a higher number makes your camera more sensitive to light. However, as you go up, you are also more likely to get more noise or more grain. If you think of 
the really bad stereo you probably had in college, if you turned the, the volume up too high, it was all crackly and noisy and it didn't sound good. Cameras are similar. A better camera can go up to a higher ISO number before the amount of noise, <clears throat> excuse me, the amount of noise or grain becomes uh, unsustainable and unusable. It's very subjective. And if you have you know, a cheap camera or an older camera, going up to a higher number is less useful. So high numbers, typically less dynamic range. Dynamic range is the amount of information between shadows and highlights that the camera can record. And uh, a higher ISO, a little bit more noise and grain. What level your camera is best at or what level is acceptable in a higher number? I can't say. I know people that swear no camera is good above 400. And I know people that have no problem going to 12,000. It's very subjective. You're going to have to just play with your camera and see. I know with my A7R4, I won't hesitate to go to 3,200 ISO. Um, but some people would rather stay at 100. I will use the lowest number I can, however. So to give you a rough idea, the numbers in red are full stops. They're the standard stops, 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1,600, 3,200, 6,400, 12,800, et cetera. Those are full stops. And then in between, you have thirds of a stop. So 64 is one third of a stop more uh, sensitive to light than 50. 80 is two thirds more than 50. I mentioned these because your camera will use those as well. It won't only use full stops. It will use those in between third stops. In general, I keep the number as low as I can because the image quality is better. If you are shooting with a Sony, 100 is the lowest number you can go to unless you turn on expanded ISO. And expanded ISO will let you go to 50 and it will raise your maximum ISO. And I always turn that on because I don't have to use it. But if I want to use it, I don't want to have to turn it on in that moment. Because 100 is, I believe, the native ISO, I'm not 100% on that. If you go to 50, there might be a tiny quality hit, but I've never seen the difference. And certainly if you go up to 100,000, there's quite a bit of noise. However, whatever ISO gets you the shot, it's better to have a shot that's super noisy with lots of grain than to not get the shot or have a shot that's very blurry. And to give you a sense of it, here is a bracket I did at 1 15th, 1 30th, 1 60th, 1 1 25th, 1 2 50th, 1 500th, 1 1,000th, and 1 2,000th shutter speeds. So the lower shutter speed lets in more light. The shutter is open longer. Higher shutter speed, shutter is open less long, so it lets in less light. Everything at F16. And then on the right, you can see that top row, ISO 100. Second row, ISO 200. Third row, ISO 800. Fourth row, ISO 3200. I skipped some stops just because it started getting less interesting to include all of them. But you can see the difference between a 15th of a second at F16 at ISO 100 and 3200. You go from the picture is too dark to the picture is too bright. I would say probably. At ISO 3200, it's somewhere between a 30th and a 60th to get the correct exposure. The highlights are a little hot at a 30th. But it lets in more light. It's more sensitive to light. If you're shooting this at F16, because you need F16, you have to crank up the ISO. And it gives you a sense of how that changes, I hope. Why might you use a high ISO? This is a photo I took in Mammoth Cave National Park at ISO 6400 handheld at one tenth of a second. So the in-body image stabilization helped a lot. I'm at 6400 ISO because at Mammoth Cave National Park, you can't use a tripod and you can't use a flash. You can only use the lights they have in the cave. So the only way to get a picture that isn't a blurry mess is to crank up that ISO. So I shot at 6400 ISO. It got me the shot. I'm happy with it. 
if you look really close, there's definitely more noise than there would be at ISO 100, but it's totally acceptable to me and it makes the shop possible. All right, now we have f-stop or aperture. The aperture is measured in f-stops. That's why it, the two terms and why it gets confusing. Uh, I tend to use them interchangeably. And what that's measuring essentially is the size of the lens opening. What it really is is a ratio of the focal length to the lens opening. But fundamentally, it's the size of the lens opening. So this is my Sony 135 G Master at f22. There in the middle, you can see the shutter blades and you can see that little hole in the middle. That's what f22 looks like on this particular lens. It's a very small hole. It lets in very little light. F8, quite a bit bigger. 1.8, you can't see the opening because it's so big, it's basically the entire lens. 1.8 is a lot more light. So a lower number lets in more light. A higher number lets in less light. Large number, say low f-stop number, large opening, lets in more light for a more shallow depth of field. What that means is how much information is in focus. When you're focusing your lens, you have a plane of focus. That's where the lens is focused. If you think of that plane of focus as a piece of paper parallel to the lens, that's what's sharp. If you're at 1.8, you have very little in front of or behind that piece of paper that's gonna be acceptably sharp. If you're at 22, you're gonna have more. So a low number, larger opening, less depth of field, less in focus front to back. Large number, smaller opening, more depth of field, more information in focus front to back. There are some trade-offs with that. So any lens, if you're all the way stopped down, say 22 or 32, you're gonna have a little bit of diffraction. It's probably not the sharpest that the lens will be, so it's a trade-off. And to get maybe a sense of how to understand why that smaller opening gives you more information that's acceptably sharp. I say acceptably sharp because it's not technically sharp, it's acceptably sharp, it appears sharp. For all intents and purposes, it's sharp enough. If you squint your eyes, Next time when you're trying to see something, you squint your eyes and things just get a little bit sharper. It's the same effect when that lens opening is small. With your aperture or your f-stop, these are some of the standard. F1, f1.4, f2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, 45, 64. F-stops also have thirds of a stop. It used to be, if you had a mechanical lens on an old film camera, your lens was marked, and if you have a physical f-stop ring, it's still marked at whatever it is, so 1.8, f2, 2.8, 4, 5, 6, and in between, you may or may not have clicks for half-stops or thirds of a stop. The advantage, one of the great many advantages that we have with modern cameras is that it's easy to do those thirds of a stop. So 2.8 to 4 is one stop, but you can do 3.2 and 3.5 in between if you need it. So you have a lot more control over your exposure. But again, one full stop. When, when photographers talk and stop, one full stop, 2.8 to 4 is one stop. 5.6 to half 8 one stop. We talk a lot. I need one less stop. Turn stop down one stop, open up one stop. All of that is referring to doubling or halving the exposure again. Hopefully that's starting to make sense. All right, this is the 135.18 focused on the door of a barn at 1.8. The door is maybe two feet away. It's pretty close. Upper left is 1.8. Below that, F2, 2.8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22. If you look at that, you can see that it's pretty dramatic, the difference between 22 and 1.8. However, 
because it's a long lens and because we are focused fairly close, it's still not sharp back there at 22. It's just sharper. Instead of just being so blurry, it's abstract, you have a sense of what's there. You can see the edge of the barn and you can see the trees back there. So there's more information, a little bit sharper, but not sharp. If you're shooting with a wider lens, your depth of field will be greater. A longer lens, it's more shallow. And to get a better sense of it, on the left, we have 1.8. On the right, we have f22. Pretty big difference. If you focus further away, your depth of field improves it. Or maybe I shouldn't say improve, because that implies that there's a right and a wrong. Your depth of field becomes greater. So here, I'm focused a little bit further down, just past that door handle. 1.8 on the left, 22 on the right. Instead of being focused a couple feet away, I'm focused maybe five feet away, same lens. But the background is sharper. As you focus deeper, you have more depth of field. If you focus at 20 feet, you've got more information front and back that's sharp than if you do than you do if you focus at two feet. Some examples of why you might use a shallow depth of field. This is a portrait I did in Prospect Park. I wanted that wall in the front to be soft. I wanted that background to be soft. So I'm shooting at 1.8, very shallow depth of field. He's sharp, but the foreground and background is soft. It helps frame it and it's not distracting. On the other hand, maybe you want a lot of information. So this is an F22. And if you want that classic star sunburst, in my experience, your best results are if you stop all the way down. So if your lens goes to 16, stop to 16. If it goes to 22, stop down to 22. But you're letting in a lot less light. As we talked about the difference between 2 and 22, it's a lot of stops. 2 to 2, 8 is 1. 2, 8 to 4 is 2. 5, 6 is 3. 8 is 4. 11 is 5. 16 is 6. 22 is 7. So that's 7 stops of light less. So your shutter speed has to be slower, or your ISO has to go up if you want that F22. Or here, uh, this is Snoqualmie Falls outside Seattle. I wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted everything sharp. So I wanted my foreground sharp, I wanted my background sharp, and I wanted that little bit of milkiness with the water. So an eighth of a second at f22 on a tripod. To get everything sharp, I wanted those trees on the right sharp. I wanted the foreground, everything. All right. Hopefully everybody's tracking. I know it's a lot. Shutter speed is how long the camera shutter is open. A longer duration shutter speed lets in more light. If you think of, if you open your front door for one second, more people can come inside than if you open it for half a second. And if you open it for 30 seconds, lots of people can come inside. It's the same thing with light. If you're shooting an 8,000th of a second, you're letting in less light. If you're shooting at 1,000th of a second, you're letting in more. If you're shooting at 125th of a second, you're letting in even still more. <clears throat> in your camera, you probably have 30 seconds as the longest shutter speed you can set up to 4,000th if you're shooting with, say, 66,000 or 6,300. 8,000th of a second if you're shooting with an A7 or an A7R4, for example. 32,000th if you're using electronic shutter on the A9. 32,000 is a very fast shutter speed. You probably also have a bulb setting, B. Bulb setting is a setting that will allow you to leave the shutter open as long as it's pressed. Typically, you would do that with an external cable release. And that should only be limited by the battery life of the camera. So with that cable release and a running lock, which is just a way to depress the button and hold it depressed, you could open up that shutter and leave it for an hour and come back and turn it off. You can get very, very long exposures with bulb setting. There are old film cameras that had a T setting, which would open when you hit the shutter and then close when you hit the shutter again. But you have a wide range. We'll explain why you might use those 
in a second. So one thing to keep in mind with, uh, with shutter speed and long lenses in particular, you have something called the reciprocal rule, which is one over the focal length when you're shooting handheld. Image stabilization helps with this. But let's say you're shooting with an A7R4 with a 85 millimeter lens. To have the best shot at being sharp, you want your shutter speed to be faster than 1 85th of a second, which would be, I think, 1 90th on the body. Or, no, 1 100th, I'm sorry. If you're shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, 1 200th of a second. 600 millimeter lens, one six hundredth of a second, or one six fortieth. That's the reciprocal rule. If you're shooting with a 600 millimeter lens at a thirtieth of a second, it's going to be a lot harder to get a sharp image because as you have a longer lens with a narrower field of view, camera shake shows up more easily. And camera shake is just the fact that none of us are, you know, metal clamps that are capable of not moving at all. Any of us taking a picture, there's a little bit of movement because we're humans. Image stabilization will help with that. Depending on the camera, you might get five stops. And depending on you, there are people who the reciprocal rule doesn't work for because they have more camera shake. Maybe you're someone that instead of a one two hundredth of a second with a, a, with a 200 millimeter lens, you need one four hundredth of a second. That's fine. There are also people that can handhold a two hundred millimeter lens at one one hundredth. Just depends on who you are, but it's a ballpark in where to start. If you're shooting with a long lens, be aware of that. The advantage, though, if you're shooting with say a twelve to twenty four, you can hold it at a twentieth of a second and probably have a sharp image. You might want a longer shutter speed because you want to shoot the classic waterfall and get that nice milky blurry water movement thing. This is a one eighth of a second at F20. On the right, we have one one hundredth of a second. You can see the one on the left is the classic pretty waterfall shot. The one on the right, you have a lot more tension. You've got a lot more activity. You can see the bits of water more. They're still blurry because it's moving quickly, but it doesn't run together in the same way. Again, there's no rights or wrongs. Most people, when they shoot waterfalls, want that blurry movement, but not everybody. And if you want it sharper, that's fine. But that gives you a sense of why you might do that and also some of the difference. So one eighth of a second to one one hundredth of a second. Or you want to shoot outside. And I know I'm, I'm going quickly, but I'm doing my best. You want to shoot outside under the stars. This is in Yellowstone National Park with the comet Neowise there. 13 seconds, f2.5 with the Sony 2414 GM. 13 seconds to get a nice long exposure to let in enough light. Because I'm at f2.5, I was at ISO 16, ISO 1600 for this. I needed a long exposure to get a correct exposure. If I had shot this at a 60th of a second, it just would have been dark. I could have cut that shutter speed in half by doubling my ISO to, my ISO to 3200. However, I also wanted uh, Old Faithful there to be as large as possible and as, vis as visible as possible. So a longer shutter speed allows for more of the geyser and the water and the steam to show up in the print. But Maybe you want to shoot sports. This was uh, when they launched the 50 millimeter 1.4 lens out in San Diego. This is a Sony a6300 with a 70 to 200 f4G. So for those of you who were part of last week, that became a 115 to 300 millimeter lens, effectively, at a 2500th of a second here. So the ball, which you know. Major League Baseball, that was probably going 90 miles an hour, that ball. But a 25th, 2500th of a second kept it pretty sharp. You can see the ball there just off the bat. If you're shooting sports, you probably want that fast shutter speed because everybody's moving so fast that if you shoot at a slower shutter speed, 
they're just blurry. If I'd shot this at a 125th of a second, that bat would be blurry. You probably wouldn't even see the ball. Probably much of the batter would be blurry. Sports, you want a faster shutter speed to freeze that motion. This is outside Penn Station when the world was different at 1.3 seconds. So 1.3 seconds, everybody's blurry. There are some people that are slightly sharper because they're standing waiting for the light. But the people that are moving, total blurry mess. That long exposure, letting in more light, gives more time for that movement to happen. All right, white balance. White balance is the color of light that the camera sees as neutral. You or I, when we're walking around, our eyes and our brain work together to neutralize most light we see. Obviously not strong colors like red or blue or whatever, but if you're inside in grandma's house with incandescent lights, which are very warm, your eyes adjust and your brain adjusts and it looks neutral. If you're outside in daylight, your eyes adjust and your brain adjusts and that looks neutral. However, daylight is blue compared to incandescent. Incandescent is orangish yellow compared to daylight. Your camera doesn't adapt in the same way. So that's what your white balance is for. It is trying to decide what color of light is neutral and everything else is either warm or cool or green or magenta. If you're on a Sony, you have auto white balance, daylight, shade, cloudy, incandescent, which I still call tungsten because that's what we used to call it back in the old days, fluorescent warm white, fluorescent cool white, fluorescent daylight white, fluorescent daylight, flash, underwater auto, color temperature filter, which will allow you to change your uh, Kelvin temperature from 2500 all the way up to 9900. And then you have custom white balance. Most of the time, I'm in, uh, uh, I'm in auto. It depends on what I'm shooting and the circumstances, but most of the time, if I'm shooting video, I'm always in custom. What custom does is it allows you to tell the camera what is neutral. So what I use typically is an X-Rite Color Checker Passport, which is a spectr spectrally neutral gray card. It also has a color chart. There are people that will just use like a white piece of paper to do a custom white balance. The challenge with that is that the white piece of paper that you use to print out your resume or your ticket or whatever isn't truly white. It looks like white just to your eye, but because your eye is compensating, it isn't actually white. It's a little bit cool or a little bit warm. And so that custom white balance based off something that isn't spectrally neutral can be a little off. Will you see it? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how picky you want to be. All right. So if you want to get really specific, but you don't want to do a custom white balance with the color temperature filter, you can see you can go from 2,500K uh, all the way up to 2,900. You can also adjust your green magenta shift and your blue orange shift. Do you need to use that? Maybe, but to be honest, most of the time you're probably better off just doing custom white. This is all those white balances we just talked about to give you an idea of the difference. Photographing this barn, auto white is what gave me the upper left, the daylight, shade, cloudy, Fluorescent warm white, fluorescent cool white, fluorescent daylight white. Uh, actually, that, for, that top one is the fluorescent warm white should be incandescent, I believe. I've mislabeled it. But you can see all these specific ones. And then on the right, I have uh, a custom set very low and a custom set very high in Kelvin. You can see there's a dramatic difference. If you are very particular, you want to tell the camera what to do rather than the reverse. You want to specify a specific white balance. Now, this is the X-Rite Color Checker Passport that I mentioned. 
let's say you're shooting a sunset or a sunrise. So you've got all that beautiful color. You want that beautiful color to show up. If you shoot an auto white balance, your camera doesn't know that that's a sunset with a bunch of color. It doesn't know that those oranges and reds are supposed to look that way. So it may adjust your auto white balance to tone those down and try and neutralize. In those situations, especially, you may consider switching to daylight instead of auto white or whatever other setting you want, but controlling it. It's the same thing with anything with a heavy color cast. If you're, I don't know, you're photographing a holiday thing with a very heavy color, you may want that color to show up and your camera may try and correct it. Be aware of that. If you take a picture, and the saturation and the color looks off, adjust your white balance. Try some different things to see what works. Daylight is full sun, middle of the day. Shade is full sun, but in the shade. Cloudy is cloudy. They should be pretty straightforward, but it's gonna vary based on your situation and your circumstances. If you are shooting in raw, it doesn't matter. If you're shooting in raw, you can fix it later. If you're shooting in JPEG, you can fix it, but only to a point. And we will talk about the differences between RAW and JPEG in a minute. So I typically, if I'm shooting stills, I don't worry about my white balance that much because I'm always shooting in RAW. If you choose to shoot in JPEG, it becomes much more important. So be aware of that. And there's nothing wrong with shooting in JPEG. It's one of those things as well. Just like professionals only shoot in manual, professionals only shoot in JPEG or only shoot in RAW. Professionals aren't a monolith. There are plenty of people that shoot in JPEG. I prefer to shoot in RAW, but you're not wrong if you prefer to shoot in JPEG. You give up some functionality and some control, but you have smaller files and maybe you don't care. Whatever makes you happy is good. All right, focusing. If you're shooting with a Sony, you have AFS, AFA, AFC, DMF and MF. AFS is autofocus single. AFA is autofocus auto. AFC is autofocus continuous. DMF is direct manual focus and MF is manual focus. What those mean is that AFS single is the camera will focus on whatever you tell it to focus on. You depress the shutter halfway, the camera will focus. There are people that prefer back button autofocus. Um, I know people that swear that professionals only use back button autofocus as well. Again, anything that professionals all do is not true. I, for example, don't like back button autofocus. So you depress your shutter halfway, that locks the focus in AFS. If your subject moves or you move and that shutter is still halfway depressed, you lose that focus. If you're not moving and whatever you're photographing isn't moving, AFS is great. AFA is automatic. It will pick if it should be in C or S, depending on the circumstances, and switch between them. And then AFC will adjust as you move or your subject moves. So if you have the shutter halfway depressed to lock focus, and you're doing a portrait and that person moves forward or back, the camera will adjust with them. If you're photographing somebody running, sports, uh, a bird in flight, uh, a deer running across the road. AFC will track that movement and focus on that subject as it moves. So it's constantly changing. I am in AFC 90% of the time, almost always. DMF is direct manual focus. It uses autofocus and then you can use manual focus to adjust the focus from there if you choose. And then manual focus is full manual. So you're telling the camera what to focus on. The 10% of the time I'm not in AFC, I'm in manual focus. If I'm photographing the stars, I'm in manual focus. If I'm photographing a still life, I'm in manual focus. If I'm photographing architecture, I'm in manual focus. Anytime the camera is locked down and everything I'm photographing is locked down, I'm typically in manual focus. Uh, just to keep everything stable so nothing changes. If you're photographing a time lapse, you probably want to be in manual focus because you don't want your focus to shift because a car went by or a person walked by or a bird flew by. 
you want everything to stay the same. On your camera, if you hit the function button, again on the Sony, every other cameras are different. In that menu, you've got AFS, AFA, AFC, DMF, MF. You also may have an AF, MF switch on your lens. It's gonna depend on the lens. However, if you have that switch on your lens and you switch your lens to manual focus, and then you wonder why autofocus isn't working and you go into this menu and you can't turn autofocus on, that's why, just keep an eye on that. All right, deep breath. JPEG and RAW. So JPEG is, we all know what a JPEG is. It's just, it's a compressed photo created in camera for the purposes of this. RAW is all the information from the camera, from the image, but not processed. So if you take a picture with RAW, a picture shows up, that's a little internally generated JPEG. But to actually do anything with the file, you need to process the RAW. So you could use Capture One, you could use Lightroom, you could use Sony's Imaging Edge, you could use any number of things to process that RAW. But you will have to process it. You'll have to do something to it before you can share it, upload it to Facebook, send it to your friends, whatever you want to do with it. A JPEG, it's already done. You're great, you're ready to go. However, because it's all baked in, it gives you less control. Your options are, with most Sony cameras, you can shoot in RAW, you can shoot in RAW plus JPEG, you can shoot in JPEG. If you are someone who is interested in shooting RAW, but not used to it, I would recommend starting in RAW plus JPEG. It can be a little bit of a big leap to go from JPEG straight to RAW. It will help you get your feet wet. And there was a time when I would shoot in RAW plus JPEG, so I had those references um, of those JPEG files. And then I realized I just had all these files I didn't need. So I just shoot in RAW. Then you have compressed or uncompressed RAW. That's gonna depend on your camera. Sony used to only offer compressed RAW. And then a lot of people said, why are we forced to only have compressed RAW? So they changed it and the newer cameras and some of the older ones with a firmware update have uncompressed RAW. What that effectively means is you've got more information because it's not compressed. The files are twice the size. And there are cert certain situations where you may benefit from that. If you're not gonna shoot RAW, just ignore all of that, it doesn't matter. I, if it's important, will shoot compressed RAW, if I'm sh or uncompressed RAW rather. If I'm photographing a lot, or if I'm photographing say sports where I need to shoot quickly, I will shoot compressed RAW. But whichever one you do, you're not wrong, whatever works. Then your JPEG quality, you have extra fine, fine and standard. Extra fine is the best quality. It's the largest JPEG uh, in terms of the least compression. Fine is in between, standard is, is less. It's a little bit like when you save a JPEG in Photoshop, if you're familiar with that, and you've got the slider for the JPEG quality. Extra fine is like a 12, I think. Fine is like a 10 and standard is like an eight. So it compresses more on fine and the least on extra fine. So for me, if I'm gonna shoot JPEG, which is rare, um, I'll shoot an extra fine unless I'm doing something where I just need a quick JPEG reference and then I'll leave it on fine, which is why it was here. And then you have your JPEG image size. This will also depend on your camera. This is the R4. With the R4, the JPEGs can be 60 megapixels, 26 megapixels, or 15 megapixels. That's the amount of information in the file. It's essentially the size of the file. So a 60 megapixel file is very large. 15 is pretty small. It just depends, again, on who you are and what you wanna do with the pictures. If you're only ever gonna share them on Instagram and you're not going to do anything to the files, you're probably fine with small. If you're shooting something important and you want to shoot in JPEG, I would go as big as possible. In general, as you can tell, because I like uncompressed raw, I want as much information as I can get, but it does take up more space. You're going to be able to fit less pictures on a card if you're shooting in extra fine and large. If you're shooting in fine and medium, you've got a lot more pictures you can put on that card. Maybe you've only got one card and you're going on a long trip. 
whatever works for you. I just think it's better to have more and then not need it than to wish you had more. All right, to give you some idea of the differences between JPEG and RAW, on the left, we have JPEG. On the right, we have a RAW file. This is straight out of camera, shot in JPEG and RAW, or RAW plus JPEG. Exact same thing. Nothing's been done to these files. They look terrible. We can all agree this is not a pretty picture. All right, the same files edited. It's the exact same edits. To do this, I opened it up in uh, Adobe Camera Raw, applied all the settings I wanted to the raw, and then applied those same settings to the JPEG. They both came up a lot. They're both a lot better than that dark mess it was before. But if you look at the JPEG on the left, you can see like the bark is a little gray. It lost some of that highlight. And some of the sky is a little gray. Some of the information just sort of got compressed because a JPEG has less information to begin with than a raw file does. So if you do dramatic changes, the information just isn't there to correct it. Whereas a raw file, because there's more information, you can correct it more easily. This is a fancy new apartment building you can see from my apartment in Brooklyn. This is that fancy apartment building way overexposed, way overexposed. And this is what it looks like with a more dramatic thing. So on the right, we have an edited JPEG with the same edits as the raw file on the left that was corrected. So the same edits made it all green for some reason and messed it up. So I also did some additional edits on the bottom right to try and take out some of that green, but it's still nowhere near as good as the raw file. So if you're in a situation where you think your pictures are going to be all over the place and there's a risk of not getting it really close to perfect in camera, raw can really save your bacon. It can really make it uh, a much, a much better picture and a usable picture instead of an unusable picture. Neither of those pictures on the right would I ever show to anyone except for the purposes of showing the differences between JPEG and raw. They look terrible. I mean, I'll admit the picture on the left, not my finest work, but it's at least closer to properly exposed. All right, we went really, really quick so that if there are questions, uh, we can answer them. If there are questions that we don't get to or you have questions in the future, you are welcome to email me. I will do my best to get back to you. However, if I don't, just email me again. All right. All right. I went Thank fast. you, Tony. I uh, know that was I was expecting uh I was expecting at least another 15 20 minutes but now you did go lightning speed. So as Tony just mentioned, if you do have any questions, get them in now. We'll start off with a question coming in from our live stream viewers. Uh why isn't ISO the correct terminology? Um I, my understanding is that ISO is the correct terminology and ISO which is what I say is the incorrect terminology. I have watched several YouTube videos that swear up and down that ISO is correct and ISO is incorrect. I've just been using ISO for so long that it's a habit and if I'm wrong, I don't care that much. I'm the same way. I got, I got lambasted for saying, not saying bokeh properly in a YouTube video. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But my understanding <laughs> is ISO pronounced as a word is correct is what I believe to be true. See, I always took it as you move it over from ASA. So by the same terms as ASA, I think nobody called it ASA. Yeah, so it was and, ASA. And I th thought it was the International Standards Organization, which is, and it's all capitalized. So all of those things yeah. to me, but if you watch a Tony Northrup video, he will tell you all the ways that you are wrong for believing it's ISO and that it is <laughs> ISO. And he's well, persuasive. He's got, he'll show you, he hit, his video about it shows videos that they created where they say ISO. And if the people that create the standards say ISO, then they're probably right. Yeah. Hey, for now, I'm sticking with this Tony right here because I, I say ISO as well. It's easier. 
or uh, ISO. I say I say ISO. I mean, it's so sort of uh, together anyway. Yeah, I mean, either way, it's like it's tomato, tomato, six yeah. one half a dozen the other. Look at this. No, no question. No questions coming in. Really, nobody. And here, Tony and I thought that this was going to be uh, the one that was going to bring in the most questions because normally everybody, when you get to exposure triangle, there's something that people don't understand. Maybe I went so fast that people are still in a daze and they don't even know what to ask. <laughs> exactly. Well, Melissa Lackey on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. Melissa does have a question. Uh, quick question about a tech issue with a Sony 90 millimeter G series. Uh, can he email it to you privately? Yeah, sure. Perfect. So Tony at TonyGale.com, as you see on there, or one of his, you, Tony, you got it covered, man. Website, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, podcast. I got to catch up. You never know what people are want to look at. You're right. Open that market up. Let's see. Elizabeth. Elizabeth says it's rude to correct how someone says something. Yes. My Canadian accent got me corrected lots of times. Potato, potato. Yes. Yeah. But people, I mean, yeah. Somebody how could you? To, people can correct me. It's fine. How do you correct the Canadian? Aren't Canadians like the nicest people on the planet? Right? No, I that's grew up that's in what Bellingham, I've heard. Right by Canada. There's lots of nice Canadians. Yeah. Michael J. Fox mm -hmm. is Canadian. Oh, is he? Who, I don't who know. doesn't like Michael J. Fox? You can't not like Michael J. Fox. And for I hope most of our viewers know who Michael J. Fox is. If you don't know who he is, you're a generation a generation younger than me, which means uh, I'm getting up there, man. If you don't know who he is, as soon as you're done with this, watch Back to the Future. Yes, and then you, then Family Ties. Family Ties is you can't not like it. Grew up on it. Let's see. We are, all right, so Elizabeth did verify they are the nicest people on the planet. So just in case everybody out there was wondering. All right. Tony, I don't see any questions coming in. So. All right. I, that you know, wasn't all, expected at all. No, I'm, I'm completely blindsided. Normally, this is the one topic that people want to see. Maybe I was uh, so I, thorough. That's what I'm gonna say is that you were so thorough that uh, I'll just believe the, that. Just, just believe. It. I mean, who would have thought the main takeaway from this would would have been the correct pronunciation of ISO or ISO? I think we should just all go back to ASA, and then it's there. You go. Then it's no dispute, no argument. Yeah. I don't know. We'll get a Tony versus Tony battle on here one day over ISO and ISO. There we that's go. Good, that's good. All right. Well, Tony. Thank you again, as always. Let's see if you can be as thorough on our part three. And uh, Sony, again, thank you for Sony, our sponsor for today. And if you do have any questions uh, before we shut this thing down, you have all of Tony's information there, at Tony Gale Photo on Instagram, at Tony Gale on Twitter, and TonyGale.com. So if you do need to reach out to Tony, feel free to do so. Until then, uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you, Tony, next time for part three, which I believe we're talking about composition, correct? That is correct. Sounds good. So until then, we will see you, Tony, then. And we'll see all of our viewers next time on another rendition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Thank you, everybody.